Okay, my good friends, I have Jim Bolin on the line here. We're doing the Zoom together, and we're sharing screens. He can see my screen. He's going to be able to talk. He's going to ask me some questions about the light experiments. Now, he's pretty up on most of everything, so, um, but I don't have every take on every little aspect of it. So, if people have questions, and they're valid questions, I mean, this is fabulous. I like this. So, Jim's going to ask and see if I can answer. All right, Jim, you ready there, buddy? Yes, I'm ready. Okay, go get them. What do you got? Okay. Okay, thank you, Roger. I just want to be sure that I understand uh, the, um, the experiment here in total. So, I'm seeing, if I got this right, I'm seeing a, a laser beam approach from the left of the screen and it's it's in it's a thin laser beam coherent light mono, monochromatic one wavelength and as it gets into the venturi in other words as it as it actually is passing through the middle of the venturi what i believe that i'm seeing is the crushing effect of that beam is causing the fission to occur on the left side of the venturi. In other words, all that backscatter is these is resulted from these white dipoles and the black dipoles fissioning, separating. Correct. Now, if, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Well, I was going to say before you go, people don't understand the venturi, and I wanted to. I'm, I was going to do a whole thing about the design of the Venturi. But what I'm going to do, and you won't be able to see it where you are, but as you know, there's there's two literally round, um, well, they were nails. And they were, there's one right here, and there's one on the other side of the Venturi here. And there's a tiny, tiny, tiny slit, which is about the size of that black ball, maybe even a little smaller. Now, so that slit is just the tight size of that black ball. And you see the black balls on the right, the same as on the left. They don't change size. They're a fixed particle. That's why they can't get through that little slit. Now, the white ones are glowy, squeezy, crushy, and, and, and extremely energetic. The black ones are, are slammers. They slam things, but they don't burn. Now, my take is is again we've got a, a round pin here and another pin underneath it coming straight out at us from the screen and the light is going down between those two pins which forces it to crush into that tiny tiny slit at that point only the white can get through so we have separated them now if that's all that's required, and it might be because you can see the power is just that, it's, it's phenomenal. And this is what CERN and Fermilab say. They want to see a muon neutrino, the black ball, which they say creates this is exponential amounts of energy. And they claim to have just found it after focusing their, their beams so that they collide head on. We don't have to collide head on. We do just we do much better than that. We because colliding head on is nothing more than crushing a field against another field, only it's head to head. We're crushing them side to side, and then we're slamming them with the black particles over and over and over like a jackhammer. So they come out the other side squirting. Not only do they squirt, we can control them, we can point them, we can put them right into a harvester. Even if CERN did get lucky enough to to find a way to smash these things to bits I don't know how they're going to harvest them the only way you can harvest them is to be able to focus them and we that's exactly what we did so does that help at all Jim that helps that helps so uh, but I want you to pick up with everything that occurs on the right hand side of the Venturi if now I see I see the whites emerging on the right hand side and then downstream from that, in other words, further to the right, I believe, you know, I see the black particles. And what I'd like to know is, are the black particles indigenous 
in the atmosphere over on the right. In other words... Okay, I got you. I remember we were talking about this. Let me just explain, and Jim would explain it well, but I just always like to jump in. <laughs> now, the black particles. I have to agree. Jim, Jim brought this point up, and I wasn't thinking about it a, a lot. Yeah, yeah, but it, obviously they're, they jump back together over here. How did they get here? How did the black particles get here if the white was separated and pushed through and the black was basically kept on the left side? How, where did the black ones come from? Now either you have to steal them from some other guy, and I don't know if that's what they did, I don't think so. Or they're just extra black ones laying around saying if there's any white guys are hanging around here we, we, we'd love to attract to you, and which is gravity. That's what they are. They're dark matter and gravity. There's no question of gravity. And the Earth sucks. The Earth sucks. It does. It's a, gra it's a gravitational source. You drop something that goes right to the ground almost every single time. <laughs> the only thing that doesn't is like helium and hydrogen and stuff like that. So, the Earth has more dark matter than it has white matter in my mind. And even the Schumann fre fre frequencies show that because at the very bottom frequency, it's extended. It's like, what was it, Jim? 7.83, something like that? That's correct, 7.83. Yeah, 7.83. And all the ones up above that are 6.5. So it's push to shove, push to shove, push to shove at 6.5. And then at the bottom, it's push to pull. So it pulls, this, it pulls that, that frequency open up to 7.83 hertz and coincidentally that is the same as your heartbeat you know that right Jim yes correct. Yeah, yeah it's amazing I'll tell you there's so much to think about when you actually start thinking <laughs> and that's just rare I get I, I I'm not kidding you Jim in the many years I've been doing this I've probably had, I and I'm not kidding you, under 10 questions from people that were physicists and experts. I've been yeah. told to go read chapter 36 five times until I know exactly what it says and then I'll be smart. I've been told that there's no way I can do whatever I'm saying I can do and there's no way that what I'm showing is really real. And I'm, I've been told over and over a million things, but questions? Nope. None. Not a one. Well, this experiment has been caught on the same type of camera that they use in particle detectors, from what I understand, so I don't see why how it couldn't be authentic. The biggest array of muon detectors, which are cosmic rays, is powered by cell phones. It's a worldwide array of cell phone data that's automatically through this app uploaded to a central receiving site. And they take all of this cell phone cosmic ray muon detections and they build a pattern for the Earth on how we're getting hit with these muons. <laughs> and it's powered by cell phones. Yes. So they and they, and they, I've been attacked about this for years. Still, they attacked yesterday about it. Every day, they, 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 this, this can't be. Can't possibly be. Well, we're looking here at radiance, luminosity, pixelization, which is pixels get excited. When they get excited, they they create a signature of that excitation. And if you have enough pixelization, which you do in this particular phone right up close and personal like this using the selfie side which apparently has more pixelization it must have in a more condensed area something like that because rod said this you know and, and again rod did virtually all of the stuff i is some other people did some stuff i didn't do the experiments much i have all the same stuff here and i did some but it frustrated the hell out of me. <laughs> it's just, it's you know, it, this is just a times consumer. You've seen all the stuff I have, Jim. I, oh, yeah. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of, of pictures. And, you know, once you start to analyze that, you, you, you just go bonkers. 
So what am I going to do? Spend all day long trying to make pictures when I'm and I have an onslaught of them coming at me already? I think you've got plenty of data right now. I, I don't need any more. I just need somebody to look at it and say, can we harvest this energy? That's all. If we could harvest it, the world would turn around on a, on a dime. Literally within a couple of weeks, being, having all of this stuff really literally sitting on the shelves. If this works, and this is a big if, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But they well, spent, you've already got you've already got some pretty good schematics drawn out that show the the collection process. Well, I have, I'm going to put my little diagram. You won't see it. I'm just going to put it in front of the screen. All I all I'm saying is if and this, this is so simple to test. But I'm not going to be believed even if I could do this and I can't do this. I'm too old and I'm I don't have these resources. But if we took this spray, and right here is a spray. On the other side, this is what the Venturi is, two round pins, and on the other side is the spray, and right here, right exactly here, is where we would collect right here. And for you, Jim, you know what I'm talking about. It's right here, up and down, is where we put our collector, right here. Right. And we collect it before it hits the black. If you can collect it before it hits the back, you run black, you run it through all your devices, and then let it hit the black. That's all. That's it, basically ground, and you could carry these things around in a lunchbox. No grid required. Never buy gasoline for your car again. If it works, if it doesn't work, you go on about your life. This is just wasting time, because right now they haven't found anything that's helping, and and they're talking about doing all kinds of things that are really going to hurt the the atmosphere, and they don't realize it because they don't realize. Electron flood theory. No electron flood theory, you're lost. Everything's dipoles. So, what do you think, Jim? I like it. I like it. I agree. Uh, I think it's time to at least engage. They are showing all of the things that I've talked about. They're saying, we all need new physics. We all know this. We're finding tetraquarks. We're finding this. We're finding that. The only thing that does exist is those two top particles here a muon neutrino and an electron neutrino and a black one and a white one and then when they hit and divide if you can do that which we did you can get that extreme energetic value of electron showers and sterile muons anyway i'm going to shut this down right now jim but i i appreciate you asking these questions and wh what i want to do is get some form of a platform going where we can engage physicists and even forget the physicists if they don't want to talk at least get you know people that are interested in physics to understand the real physics instead of just saying I have to say what the professor told me or I will be failed and that's right now that is the case there is no room for discussion once you start that you're on the road to destruction. They'll keep your money and tell everybody you're an idiot because you couldn't say what they told you to say. Do you think that's right or wrong? Yeah, it's very sad. And I hope I hope you get plenty of response on this. I do too, but I you know, I gotta be honest with you, I am not optimistic, my friend. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Well and, as as energy prices keep going up, I think I think it's really gonna be become more and more important as time goes on. Well, I, I got to be honest with you, Jim. I don't think the Earth is going to survive much longer. It's yeah. because of the swelling of the gases that surround the Earth are scrubbing harder and harder and harder against, against the particles that are in space. And it's just hotter and hotter and hotter out there. It's 2,700 degrees last I checked where our atmosphere scrubs the other atmosphere of space and we have an all the tornadoes and hurricanes oh you know what I was gonna do hold on one second we should do this pretty soon hold on where was it here oh you see this knowing God's thoughts this is Don Lincoln I'll have to look into that observer effect <laughs> All right, this is what we want to look into, the jet stream. Oh, yeah. I was looking into it. It's just obvious once you start looking into it. 
the the jet stream there's an upper jet stream and then there's a lower jet stream anyway we'll have to look into this but it shows exactly how the particles interact and how they pick up moisture and then they condense and now because they used to have a soft condensation now they have a hard condensation so I believe we're gonna see extreme floods on the coastlines as they condense and push the atmosphere together coming off of the waters and and just total dryness in the center floods um, absolute droughts and absolute floods that's what it looks like to me now it's looking that way right now Roger it sure is and 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 it's it's obvious once you understand the impact of the earth spinning through these charged particles they have to interact and and the more you swell the envelope that surrounds the earth the more scrub the more scrub the more tenant tornadoes hurricanes floods and because water is going to be in the atmosphere picked up over the oceans because now it's hotter than hell and then once it hits a compression zone that's all it is water is condensation what does condensation means it means compression so once you push that air that's saturated on top of a landmass, it just crushes and rains. And it'll rain like hell. And when that does, you get all kinds of, the, the, the turbulence is the, is the key to show you that you're having condensation and compression. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll look into it because I want to, it's called, I believe it's the Coriolis effect that we want to look into, is the upper compression versus the lower compression. Absolutely, that would cause the scrubbing you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, it's, so. yeah, and it's really, and I can watch the patterns. Absolutely, no question, it's pushing to shoving, of uh, patterns coming. All we'll, we'll look into it. That'll be a whole another another fun day, buddy. Okay, sounds good. All right, all you uh, mud fossil people, we you know stick with us. We're going to look into every little thing there is, because every little thing there is has not been looked into. That's the way I'm seeing it now, you know, and, and we want to engage. I've learned a lot from Jim. He's brought up a lot of things that I just didn't consider having sort of one-sided point of view. But, I, you know, I'm a materialist. So when I see something, it sort of hits me and I sort of go on. But I'm pretty confident of what I'm saying. Now, he asked me questions. Everything you've been doing is very eye-opening for sure. Well, I appreciate that, my friend, and you know, you you have some pretty good eyes, so that means something to me. All right, we're going to be just keeping, we're plugging away at this basically every day, I, you know, I, that's what I do. That's my life. <laughs> okay, we shall meet again, my friends.